I've always had I've always had various business ideas. If I'm not doing enough anyway, I'm sort of I'm all or nothing. It, it's just about it's about hustling. You know, it's about hustling then, it's about hustling now still. Hello everybody and welcome to my podcast, Taking Care of Business. My name is Paul Cheatham Cash and today I'm delighted to have with me friend, actor and co-founder of children's charity Once Upon a Smile, Mr Daniel Gillings. How are you? I'm very well, thanks mate. Yourself? Yeah, very good. Very good. So today we're going to have a little bit of chat, learn a little bit more about you. Then we're going to um, go into a little bit about your acting, find out a little bit about that. And then the real focus, I guess, of why we're here today is to talk about the charity once more. Yeah, my, how, why it was started and how it's moved on. So before we before we kick off with um, the acting side, before that, it was a policeman. I was, yeah. Was that straight from school? So, so what did you do straight from school? So basically, uh, I was the youngest police officer in Great Manchester Police when I joined. Um, At what age? Just turned eighteen and a half uh, from, from applying and, and, and starting. By the time I'd finished my training, I just turned nineteen. Um, I was floating about, probably the best use of the term, in, in, various, mm. in various jobs and I wasn't sure what way to do. Um, and no word of a lie, I was sat at some traffic lights in my mum's car, right, on Alan Turing Way and a police van went past with its lights on. And I just thought to myself, do you know what, that looks fun. Yeah. And I thought to myself, I wouldn't mind giving that a go. And I thought, I'm 18, so I probably won't get in yet, but what I'll do is I'll apply I'll find out what the process is, and I might just go travelling for a bit. When I come back, I can pick it up again, now knowing what yeah. that, that process will be. Um, so, they were doing a big uh, recruitment drive at the time. So I just applied, did the application form, uh, sent it off, heard back, you passed the application form. Perfect. It's on to the, on to the next part. And in the end, there were about six Six different, six different tests. They were physical tests. I had a phys physical test, yeah. And there was six different tests. There was like an English test, a maths test, a physical test, a medical, uh, and, it, and then obviously the final interview. And as each stage progressed, I was passing, and I was passing, yeah, yeah. and I was passing. You wasn't working at the time, though. Um, I was still working, yeah. yeah. So I was working at a call centre for a place called Office Depot. I saw that station with me. And, um, and as it was going on, I was thinking, I might actually actually get in here. Um, then there was a slight st stumbling block because I had a heart operation when I was three. Oh, um, yeah, so I've got a heart murmur. So this is obviously we need we need to, we need to go for, for another medical. So in the end, there are three medicals. On the third medical, the doctor listened to my chest and he went, "Do you know you've got a heart murmur?" And you knew this at the time. I knew this. He knew this because it was my third one. <laughs> but anyway, so. You do various tests and, and, and everything. I'm colorblind as well, just to throw that in right. the <laughs> And um, they were saying, oh, we don't, we don't know why you, if you're colorblind. So I had to do this, I had to do a different test. You know those tests you did at school where there was like, there's numbers in it? Yeah. yeah. No chance. Really? Give me one of them, no chance. But, so I, I did an alternative one, and it was like the closest pink to this and, and stuff like that. Yeah, it's not really how colorblindness works, to be honest. So I, so I passed that, um, passed the medical, and it was time for the, um, final interview so I went to the final interview in a suit that was then one size too big but that was the trend as you well know well, it's like just <laughs> as you well know that was a trend and um, I did the interview and they went okay you just bear with us we're just going to go outside the room they went outside the room they walked back in and the guy went and it was a big guy welcome to Great Manchester Police I'm sat there like I said in this suit that's too big 18, 18 and a half thinking Jeez, like I've had to, I've had to get in it. So then I waited for my letter. A couple of months came, the letter came through. Start date, and um, I had a neighbour actually who had joined about five, six months before, and he was telling me all these stories. So if there's anyone watching that, he's a police officer or knows a police. There used to be a training centre called Bruges, and um, it was, it, you were training to be a police officer. So there was a level of professionalism, but there was also a bar and a pub oh, okay. after that, you know. Yeah. And uh, I was quite, I was excited for it. My letter came through. Bruce is overcrowded. You go at Hutton in Preston, so right. I, so I missed out on that. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. so I went to Hutton, um, and yeah. So 
finished my training at 19, but to be honest, the training was, I got homesick. I was the youngest one there. Probably the next youngest to me um, was about 24, 25, yeah. which, is, which is six years. I'd never yeah, been yeah, away yeah, from home. Yeah. Uh, I got insomnia, I couldn't sleep, could not sleep. So what I decided, I thought to myself, what I need to do is go home every night and just drive back. Even when I was at home, I couldn't sleep. But anyway, yeah, I got through that. How, uh, long, how long was that? So my training was for 15 weeks. So I did two weeks at Presswoods and I think went away for 15 weeks. Uh, to put in. So that was like Monday to Friday, come home at weekends. Um, and you passed that and then out of work? That, you've passed you've... that, you get your placement. So I was stationed in Stockport. Um, and then what you do is you go back to Presswoods and you meet a tutor. So you have two tutors, five weeks at a time. And you basically buddy up with them. So you go out with them and you, uh, you kind of learn the trade, if you like. Yeah. Um, so your first tutor will pass you or you've got sort of certain targets you've got to, you know certain incidents you've got to attend to so you can you can learn how the process works yeah um, and then you pass that you pass that you're on your own uh, you're not on your own in a car sure back then it was different it's completely changed from I joined in 2002 um, and if I told you what it was about like in 2002 to what it's like now do you remember the program Life on Mars I never seen that right so it goes back to to the 70s and it's or standing on toes and did you do it? And lots of people stood on people's toes, but yeah. it, but it, the difference now is, is vast. You think I'm going back years yeah. and years yeah. and years. Um, you know, then you had radios where people could hack into the radio. So you'd be driving down the road with your radio, and you'll get someone, some scroll, <laughs> <laughs> some someone shouting in the radio. It's oh, you're all blah, 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 blah. There's nothing you can do about it oh, now. Okay. It's all airwaves. You can't hack them, and it's, it's completely the job's completely changed. Yeah. Um, but to be fair, I loved it. So yeah, so when you first pass your training, you, you, you're walking, you, you're the bobby on the beat, you're walking about, yeah. and it's kind of a slow introduction to, to meet people, to talk to people. Sure. Um, so I did that for nine years, loved it, um, until a certain point. You was doing a bit of acting at the same time, I not Yeah, so I did about three years in the police, um, and I, I didn't think of anything else, I thought, this, this is me. So I'm going to do this, I'm going to become a sergeant, I'm going to work my way up. This it must have toughened you up. You see a lot of stuff, you've told me about some things. I've seen, did. smelled, heard things that nobody, nobody should have to, nobody should have to experience. Uh, when, I, when I was in training, the guy said to me, you'll either be one of the lucky ones that don't see that much, or you're going to be one of the other ones. Right. And I was one of the yeah. other ones. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so... Two, two, three years, I'd thought of nothing else. And then I started getting um, the acting book, which I'd not had since school. No one I know was, knew was an actor. Um, so I said to my mate, do you fancy going to an art school and, and try and uh, uh, and acting at the time? He said, yeah. Started at six o'clock and at quarter past five, he ran me, he went, no, I'm not, I'm not going. And I remember, I was laying on my bed and I was thinking, do I go? Or, or so just sack it off? And then I was thinking, what? Right, do you know what? I'm going to go because what have I got to lose? Yeah. And honestly, from, from the moment I walked in... How old were you then? I was about 23, 22, 23. From the moment I walked in and did it, I, I just fell in love with it. I just completely fell in love with it. And over time, that slowly took over the love that I had for the job of, of, of being a policeman. Yeah. Um, I, I, I loved being a policeman because it was exciting. It was so exciting. I say now, people say, do you miss it? I do, I miss nights. I miss working really? nights, yeah. Um, because it's exciting. That's the, you know, nights and the time you can go out and, you know, someone walking down the street at three o'clock in the morning, why is he walking down the street at three o'clock yeah, in the morning? Yeah, yeah. Someone walking down the street at three o'clock in the afternoon, completely different scenario. Um, so the acting slowly took over my love for, for the policing and the policing was changing and it was changing quickly and it wasn't changing for the better. Now we've all got our opinions sure. on what it's like now, um, but you could see what direction it was going. And uh, to be honest, it just weren't for me. This was then, this what, what year would this have been about? So this, yeah, so this was about, no, mm -hmm. this was, started in, um, I started acting about 2005, and it was about 2009 where I started to think this, this isn't for me. And it was probably over a, a three year process right. from, thinking this in for me to knowing that this this work this work for me. Um, so you got an agent, you're doing some acting, you get an agent again. Yeah, it completely changed. So I was at night school, I did my graduation show. And all the way through through going to 
I say drama school, but it weren't your traditional drama school. But all the way through drama school, everyone in the class was desperate to get an agent. They're desperate to work. I was just enjoying it for what it was. I was just enjoying doing it. I had a job. I didn't need a job. It was more of a hobby. Um, and from a graduation show, I got an agent, and I was the only one out of the class that got an agent. And then it just changed. Then I wanted to work. So from not being that bothered to wanting to work, and what happened was, I wasn't ready to work and I wasn't ready to audition. So even now, I went to some auditions that I just weren't ready for. And even those auditions that I went to then, which we're talking 10 years ago, have still that reputation, have battled and battled and battled until now to get over that because I mean, it was dreadful. Oh really? Yeah. Um, oh, really? And it's you basically, you know, if you go in an audition with a yeah. casting director and you're bad, yeah. Why were they going to waste their time getting you sure. in? Because all they think is last time he came in, it was dreadful. Um, so, but I, I, what? How many rejections ago, did you have? In loads. Terms, yeah. loads. And, and you still do. And you still do. But things happen in life where you've got to be brave and bold and make a decision. And if it's not right, you might not get a job because you don't look right. Yeah. That's, there's nothing you can yeah, do about that. Um, and and the, to be honest, the rejection is part of being an actor. If you can't handle it, you can't do it. It's not for you. Yeah. So your first role? Yeah. How long have you been? Crime watch. Oh, was he really? Right. <laughs> Crime watch. Playing a policeman. Really? <laughs> right. Well, and um, that must have been easy. Then. It, it, that was the best audition I ever had because they put a chair out and they said to me, "You're a police officer. You're chasing a car." He was improv. Your police officer, you're chasing the car. Go. Nailed it. Really? Yeah, <laughs> Nailed yeah, it. Yeah. And it was in town, and I literally got from town, got all oh, my agent rang when you got the job, which I knew it because if someone else had got that job over me, then there was something serious yeah, 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 yeah. Um And so it was crime watch my first ever job. And I was on the credits for five years. So do you know when people say, oh, you're an actor? Oh, I know your face, crime watch. No, genuinely, yeah, crime watch. Really? So I was on the really? credits first. So that was your first one? First one. And did they come thick and fast after that? Or? No. 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 Uh, it, it's just about, it's about hustling. You know, it's about hustling then, it's about hustling now, still. Um, you can only, you can only get a job if there's a job available. And you can only go in the room and meet 10 other blokes or 15 other blokes that, that look like I'm walking into a room with 10 other damn jillings. And it's, 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 you know, we don't know what a casting director is looking for. We can only go in and do what, what we do. And if we get the job, it's great. Sure. Um, and if you don't, you've just got to move on. You've got to forget about it. But it takes you a lot just to forget about it. You still love it as much now as you did 10 yeah. years ago. Yeah. And the thing is, you, don't, you never know when that, you never know when that break's going to come. You may never come, or it might come next week. It could be when you're yeah. 58. Exactly. So, so as long as you love doing it, I guess. The thing is, what, what, yeah, what's great about acting is, you could start now. There's nothing stopping you starting now because because acting is portraying life. Yeah. So, you know, someone could start at 60, 65, someone could retire and, and start it because they'll always be looking for someone of, of that age or how they look. There's no there's no limits on it. And that's what that's the magic about about yeah. the acting industry yeah. is is you know, you, you can start it at whenever you want, sure. So then we've got the charity. Yeah. Yeah. You, um, how did you meet Danny Miller? So Danny Miller is a co-founder of it. Yeah, so I met Danny because um, I've always had I've always had various business ideas. If I'm not doing enough anyway, but I've always had various business ideas um, floating around and, and tried to put them together. But I'm I'm sort of I'm all or nothing. So I'll have a great idea and I think that idea is going to work. But to be honest, it's not going to get me full attention. So there's no point in me doing it. Um, and I've always had a few different ideas. So what I decided was to set up a charity football team. This is way before the charity. Um, mm. And we'll play some football matches and we'll try and raise a bit of money for charity. Even if it's only quite a game, we'll sure. give, it to, give it to charity. Um, and then as I started getting more acting work, that changed to actually, let's get these lads from Hollyoaks or Corrie or whatever who like playing football um, to see if they want to yeah, they want to play. So I started playing football for the Emmerdale team because I did an episode of Emmerdale, got on with them, talking about football, and they said, "Meal, we've got a game at weekend. Do you want to fancy coming yeah, down?" Yeah. So we get there, and they 
through no fault of anybody, there'd be three cast members from, from the show and everything and every was made up of friends and mates and what have you, including myself. And I was like, it's, it's a bit, it's unfair really, because if you're paying a five to go and watch people from a certain show, you want to really see people from a certain yeah. show. <clears throat> um, so I thought, why not open it up? So it's not related to a specific show, but it's just a mix of anyone who wants to play football. Because Coronation Street used to have and Hollyoaks used to have. They all have separate stuff, teams, yeah. yeah. Is that all disbanded now? No, they, they still do. Yeah, they still do. But I thought, rather than limiting it to one, if we just have a mix, it could be anyone from anyone. Um, and it started, it was growing and growing and growing. And obviously, when I worked on Emmerdale, um, I worked with Danny. So I got on well with Danny, and Danny started playing, and that's how that's how I got to know. We just we hit it off, really. Um, and the team became quite successful. It was raising um, a nice amount of money for, for a charity, and we were, were making a donation. Um, Various charities at the time. We'd just choose a charity and, and make the donation. Um, and I, what sort of set it off for me, really, was when I had my heart operation when I was three, I had, I had my daughter Mia, and when she was three, I thought it took me back to what did my mum and dad go through when I when I had this. Now I'm not saying I've had some major heart operation. Um, what I actually had was it, it was done through my groin because I was so small. But I just thought there's no way that I'd, I'd be able to go through that now. With it, 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 I don't know what how I would cope with it. Sure. Um, so I thought, you know what, I'm going to give something back. So what I want to do is I want to raise some money for, for the ward that I had my operation on and just, just give something, something back. Um, obviously that ward doesn't exist anymore because we've got the Royal Manchester Children as well, which is great. And at the same time of this, the football team was doing really well. Um, and I was, I was good mates with, with Danny and then sadly a producer died uh, on Emmerdale, Gavin. Um, and left behind a young family. Um, Danny came to us and said, look, I want to really f do something to support the family. I said, yeah, it'd be fine. There'd be loads out there. Let's have a look what's out there. And, you know, we'll do, we'll see what we can raise for the football matches. Um, and he, he said, no, but I really want to look what support for this family. Um, so we started looking into it. And the more we looked into it, the more we couldn't find anything. So we found a lot of support that was available someone was terminally ill or if they were ill and there's a lot of support up until the moment that person dies and from that person dying then there's very very lim little yeah so if someone's claiming care is allowed to care for that person as soon as that person dies gone if that person's got a mobility car it's going back so before you know it there's secondary losses so you know let's say it's somebody that's lost the husband. They've lost the husband. They've lost the carer's allowance. They've lost the mobility car. They're losing very, loads of things coming all coming at once. Somebody's lost their dad. Yeah. Yeah. Who, yeah. You know, so they might no longer be able to afford that house. So they might have to move to that house, which means then now they're moving to school. And before you know it, there's five or six secondary losses all coming into play. So we were saying, there's got to be something. There's got to be something. There's got to be something. So we looked into it, and and there was nothing. Um, and something sparked, I, I couldn't even tell you what it is, something sparked and we said we need to look at seeing what we can do to, to change it. Um, so we said, when I, when I said to people I was going to be a police officer, loads of people told me not to or you won't be able to. I don't, none of my family are police officers, you won't be able to, you're 18, you, you know, you, you won't. You, I mean, when I was 18 I was skinny, I was baby faced. Yeah, yeah. Right? You won't be able to, you won't be able to. And then I did it. When I told people I was going to drama school to be an actor, people laughed. I was like, no, Chen, you won't be able to be able to do that. Again, none of my family or anyone I knew at the time were actors. And the same thing happened when we said we're going to set up a charity. Don't bother, there's too many rules, regulations. Find one that does it, donate to them, it's easy because then when you're fed up with it, you can just walk away. Yeah. And that took me back to all these people saying, you couldn't be a police officer, you couldn't be an actor. Well, you told me I couldn't, and I have been. You told me I couldn't, and I have been. You told me I can, so I'm going to. And from that, it, that's I think that was the, the spark. The spark of wanting to, to be able to give something back as well, I think. Yeah. Um, but it, it took a lot of planning, and I think those people saying, don't bother because there's too many rules, regulations, you'll get bored of it, this, that, and the other, helped really, because then we got into, we need to look at long term. Let's not set something up that's going to last for two years and prove everyone right because what's the point of that we've just wasted our time yeah 
Uh, so we did loads and loads of work. What we're going to do? Who we have? Who are we going to be? What's going to be our criteria? What are we going to offer? Um, and that's kind of how how it was born. We we spoke to local hospices and just said, "What's out there? What's needed?" Um, and that's kind of how we started the the sort of the model really to create once upon a smile and over those years it's, it's developed 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 and, and become you set it up it's about six and that is it seven years seven it? years so 2000 august 2011 we launched it as a registered registered as charity, registered charity yeah. all formally set up yeah and then what you had your football team so that was bringing so in yeah in. so we thought okay so what we need to do now is um we're going to offer support to families that have suffered a bereavement so it's after the loss of a loved one and at the time it was just a loved one um, so we're going to look to offer them financial support because we're thinking someone might be ill for a long time and might need the heating on for six months that person then dies and they, not only have they lost this 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 and this but they've also just got a gas bill on the doorstep to say you owe this um, so let's start offering them financial support but let's tailor that support we'll ask them what what do they need now we knew we couldn't go out there and say what do you need if someone came to us and says well I owe this, 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 we, we limited to what, what we can do. So at the time we, we put on it utility bills, rental arrears or food vouchers. Um, but then from that we also thought these families might just need a day out. They might not need financial support, they might just need someone to say listen we can provide you with a day out with your family, where do you want to go? So when we initially started, it was financial support, for utility bills, rental areas, and food vouchers, or a day out. Um, and we thought, right, so we know what we're gonna, who we're gonna support, we know how we're gonna support them, but how are we actually gonna support them? Because we sat here with, <coughs> yeah, you know, to register a charity, you need 5,000 um, pound. And we were just too late, because Danny did uh, Family Fortunes the month before but the charity had to be registered. We weren't at that at that stage, and we, we just missed out. Um, but we are we had the football team, so we had a good foundation. So we spoke to the lads and said, "Look, this is what we want to do. This is what we want to create, um, and this is how we have to create it." So we managed to get the start up fund from that. We became registered, yeah, uh, and then we put out there. We come up with a name. We come up with Sidley, yeah, um, the mascot, yeah, and then we we put out there. Look, this is what we're creating. Um, we spoke to Gavin, uh, we spoke to Susie, Gavin's yeah. wife, explained to her what, what we were doing and, and Danny as to why he wanted to do it. Um, we did the gala dinner on, we, on, yeah, on behalf of... that's right. Yeah. Um, so that, that must have been a defining moment because I went to that gala yeah. dinner and I still think about that dinner now. It kind of was very impactful in terms of, there was two things that impacted me at the time. One was the quality of the gala dinner, so it was kind of like the sign of things to come, how sort of professional organised, yeah. etc. is going to be. And the other part, which is which is um, different to most, what, well, what some other charities may set up from, which is you raise money and create a foundation to build from. And of course, some people do a charity ball, and there's nothing wrong with that. They do a charity ball, they raise 10 grand, they send the 10 grand to, uh, to whatever the cause is, and they start again. Um, and it was never your, yours and Danny's intention to do that, was it? It was always, even from day one, this is the standard yeah. that we're going to set ourselves. And it's been hard to follow up that standard yeah, in some of course, yeah, And two, we're not going to be here in one year or five years or ten years. This is a 20, 30, 40 lifetime stroke thing. Yeah. That, that was the approach you had. And, and I guess you was quite young doing it and Danny was even younger. I mean, how old would Danny be now? Uh, Danny's 26. Ooh, I don't know, so he was now, like so he really was, early, yeah. but so it's quite a mature approach to have for uh, setting it up. Yeah, I mean, neither of us have come from a charity background. Okay, neither of us are business owners, although we've tried our hand at various businesses, and um, it was the same with you know you only gain that experience from, from doing it. But neither of us had run a charity before or worked for a charity before. Um, but I remember coming in for, for the meeting for the meeting and with yourself and then saying this is what we, we're going to achieve and saying how are you going to achieve it and then saying well we're going to bring in as much money as we can for 12 months and we're not going to spend a penny yeah uh, but do you know what I mean being 
yeah. you know, being in your in your, your twenties and having no charity background to say to someone, we're going to bring in as much as we can for twelve months and not spend anything. For a lot of people, it sort of rings like alarm bells to say, hang on a minute, if you bring in ten grand, you need to be spending ten grand, yeah. and as soon as you can. But if we did that, we but would if be somebody it. comes in the week after and needs it, you've got no money. If we bring in ten grand this week and spend ten grand, and then you come to me and say, I need to pay my rent, rent. Yeah. and then I say that's not a problem, Paul. We can help you. I'm going to organise a charity football match in November, and hopefully, we'll raise enough for it. You're going to be out of your house. You're going to lose it. Yeah. Um, and we knew that, and we knew that that people coming to us for support it's a massive thing to ask for support certainly to ask for financial support because a lot of people are proud and they don't want to and they want but we know that you, when these families come to us they're coming to us because they're desperate family coming to us saying I'm four months behind on my mortgage because my husband died and my house is about to be repossessed they haven't got two months for us to try and do a fundraiser they need that support and they need that support now yeah. um, and, and after the first year you've always been able to do that yeah um, so we have, what we had to do is get over that first year to explain to people why we've not spent any money. But even then, even then, we didn't spend the full amount of money. Because what we then decided to do was, okay, so we've raised this figure. This figure is now our um, assistance fund for the year going forward. Uh, because as much as we would want to stay within that, there's no guarantees we, we would stay within that. Uh, and we wanted to grow as a charity. so. We might have had a, an incredible first 12 months, but there was nothing to say the next 12 months we were going to be. But we still want to offer the same level of support going forward year on year and year and year to grow the charity. Yeah. Um, and so that has always been the driver. It's yeah. always been the driver to just help more people every year. More and people that's, that's every happening. single year and grow the charity every year and adapt to what's needed. Adapt yeah. for, we only learn off the families that we support of what's, of what's needed. So since 2011, the plans of what Once Upon a Smile offered and yeah. was going to support is drastically different now to what we support because we, we because we're young, we're dynamic, and we'll change to what's needed. Yeah. Um, so how's that changed? So we started off with respite breaks. Yeah. And financial assistance. So yeah. you still do that. Still do that. There's, there's additional. Yeah. So about about four years ago. Um, so what we did when we started we opened it up so when we went to the meetings with local hospices and in a nutshell was told there's no further support from from that point what we thought is okay so if we're going to offer this support now how do families know about it but not only how do families know about it but how do we make sure that this family coming to us actually needs that support it's the way of the world as, yep. as sad as it is people out there that will claim for whatever they're not they're not due so we went back to the hospices okay that support that you told us is no longer there is now is here so you as a hospice or a hospital or another charity can now make referrals to ourselves so we know that if this referral comes from a hospice we know it's legitimate um, but then we thought we also need to open it up to self referrals as well, but we need to ask for support and evidence, and we'll tell them that as soon as they make that self referral, we will say we may need this support and evidence because we're going to have to probe and ask certain yeah. questions. Um, and it was working well. So financial support, respite breaks, referrals from um, hospitals and hospices were coming through, and it was fine. Um, and what I started doing is looking into how can we raised more money to help more families and I thought schools is a great idea and as soon as I thought of schools I realised that we're missing a massive massive chunk of, of children's childhoods. Probably a school teacher is the person who has the most contact with a child other than parents. So it might not actually be a hospice because the loved one who died might not have been in a hospice. Yeah. Um, the hospital they might have had very limited uh, support. So we started getting in contact with schools saying, look, this is what we offer if you need us. And what we started seeing is a pattern for the schools coming to us saying, yes, can you provide children's counselling? Can you provide bereavement counselling? It's bereavement counselling, bereavement counselling. Yeah. And then we were thinking, okay, so this is what's needed. So this is kind of what we're going to have to adapt to now because all these schools are asking for this. Um, but we didn't just want to we didn't want to commission somebody in because then where do you stop? So we start commissioning people in, 
And at what point do we know that that child's had the support that that child needs? Or, you know, you might charge 50 quid and they might charge 75 and they might charge 100 and they might need 10 and they might need 20. You're losing control. And before we know it, yeah. But we knew that that support was needed. So we had to come up with a solution. Uh, and everything happened, there's, there's a reason everything happens and it was perfect timing because um, one of the charities that we took referrals from was a charity in Wigan offering children's freedom and support and it's uh, what we offer now yeah. in essence yeah. um, although it's adapted and it was Kelly who ran the charity um, What happened to that charity? That charity was closing down uh, because it was funding had come to an end um, and, was, and they tried and they tried but they just couldn't get the funding the funding to keep it going um, but the everything that they offered was what we needed to offer um, so what we did Kelly and I had discussions and, and, and with Danny and, and we in a nutshell have incorporated the charity that Kelly had into Once Upon a Smile um, and began to offer children's breathing and support groups yeah. uh, that was four years ago and those have massively, massively developed. And from those developing, the team have developed, yeah. and the charity as a whole has How many is in the team? Massively. So we've got six full-time members of staff now. What do they do? Just to give um, So we've got, we have three, we've got Kelly who oversees the children's breathing and support department. We've got two support workers um, who run the children's breathing and support groups. Um, How many children a month are coming through the doors now? On average, we've probably got 100 children, uh, monthly users. Yes. Um, but some of those children access more than one group per month. Um, we've got uh, our fundraising team as well. Um, so the, the team, I mean, that team's grown recently as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'd say up until, so at the start in 2014 is when Kelly came on board. Yeah. So then there was myself and Kelly daily uh, running the charity, and then the team probably grew within the last within the last two years, yeah. and that was a bit of a shock. <laughs> because, as you say, the, the the service offerings change massively. Yeah, yeah. So the the, the, uh, the other thing that's changed is the way you raise money. So maybe we just talk a little bit about the different um, re revenue streams, yeah. or the fundraising streams you've got. So you've still got the football team, of course. So the football team, which is has grown massively as well over over time. So, you know, we've started off with uh, companies sponsoring us, smaller companies, and and then a slightly bigger company sponsored us, and then a bit of a bigger company sponsored us, and then JD sponsored yes. us. Yeah. Um, which and that's been for four or five years. Uh, yeah. JD Sports now, yeah. Which, is, which is, has has been massive for us. And um, the difficulty with the football team is is the turnaround of players, because um, obviously we're selling a charity football team where you might see someone from Emmerdale but they might work on Emmerdale for six months and then they might not, and two years later, they still want to play football for you. They, yeah. they love the charity and why they're raising money, but they're no longer on Emmerdale. Or, yes, yeah. and, it, and it's, it's, a tough, it's a tough one because you've got to, keep that, got to keep that balance because then with the next breath, there's nothing to say he's then not going to get another job next week on something else and, and then the profile yeah. goes up again. Yeah. So we've got the football team, which we've got some ex-pros in there as well. Yeah, we need some, there. yeah, to make us. Yeah. To make us work <laughs> but you play some good teams, don't you? We do, yeah. We play yeah. some great teams. We play some all right teams. Yeah. Um, the problem we've, we've got sometimes is when everyone's available, we've we've got a really yeah. good team. You'd be surprised at the standard of some of the players, yeah. actually. You're not including yourself. In there. <laughs> I wasn't including you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but we have, but we throw in a couple of ex pros and it makes you think yeah, you can play course, football yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, until you come up against ex pros and you realise actually you, you can't yeah. uh, but it is, a, it is a good standard and we travel around the country but what we play we play a lot of repeat games so you know games we played last year we played again this year but the problem is if you beat them last year they can prove the team this year and then they batter us this year yeah, yeah. Um, but that's a that's a you know a big uh, a big sort of source of income for us corporate support is, is massive for us um, but as well, you mentioned earlier, the, the Grand Ball is our yeah. uh, singular biggest event that we do throughout the year. It's our most, um, it's our, the event that costs us the most to put on, but it, the income we get from it is, is great. But it's not just that, it's the awareness that we JD Sports, I think, came from. from yeah, they did. 
Um, and like you mentioned, the very first one that, that still sticks in your mind. From from the from that very first event, Danny and I said that, and it, it sounds crazy really, because bearing in mind we just launched the charity, it's about raising as much money as we possibly can raise. We're about to put on the biggest event that we've, we've put on, and we're going to launch Once Upon a Smile. And we said, we, it's not about raising money. Yeah. It's not about raising money, it's about raising the awareness of what we're doing. And if we raise some money, then we raise some money. But our sole intention of the, the Grand Ball... This was the first the very one, first one. you made money, and I think everyone's made more money after yeah. that. Yeah. We said, if we want to be a long term, what we've got to do is, we've got to do this event every year, and every year it's got to get bigger, and it's got to get better. And the difficulty with any event is selling the tickets. Um, and what we decided is, if we make this event different to all the other charity events, better than all the other charity events, then when we come to do it next year, and people say, what have you got planned for the Grand Ball? And we go, it's bigger and better than last year. They're going to go, do you know what? I had one table last year, I'll have two, or I have two tickets, I want a table. And and over the years, that's that's what we do. We sell out within days. Yeah. Uh, we don't even advertise that. Uh, we might put something out saying, and now available. And then before you know it, we put it up saying, yeah, it, 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 now it's gone. Yeah. That's a great bit, bit uh, income stream and brand builder. Then you've got the football team where you've got a lot of... Um, um, Volunteers, yeah, all the players volunteer. Yeah. But it's fair to say that there's lots of the, the other income streams is just full of volunteers. I think is doing so. What yeah, types of the other th- there's volunteer. I mean, vo- volunteers are completely separate. Like, there's a completely separate subject to volunteers. To yeah. us, they're invaluable. Yeah, uh, absolutely invaluable. But for fundraising wise, we we get a lot of support um, from from fans of Danny's, which is invaluable support. Uh, from corporate support, um, a lot of people do the uh, marathon or skydives or what have you. And because we we seven now, what we find it is families that we may have helped in 2012 and 2013, and that's beginning to fundraise for us. Um, and we have a full calendar throughout the year of yeah. of events. Obviously, we've got our fundraising team putting on events, but we have a lot of support from the families that we've supported as well, which yeah. which is. Yeah, you know, which is which is nice, which is something you know, it's, it's amazing, really. Yeah. And this kind of is that swelling because every year you look at the the year end of the charity is August. Every time you look at the accounts, there's more money raised yeah. this year than the year before. The kind that there's just that swelling, I guess, of just more people knowing about it, more volunteers volunteering, um, bigger companies. I yeah. think like Trafford Centre. You're the um, fountain fund. The fountain the fund. Fund. So there's bigger. It's just it's just kind of a swelling. It is, and the, you know, there's no one offering the support that we that we offer. Um, we've not got budgets to go on billboards and TV and radio, and a lot of our support is word of mouth. Yeah, we'll get phone calls daily saying, you know, I know someone who's child you support, and you know this has happened, and and that's. A lot of it's word of mouth, and I think, to be honest, that's the biggest praise you can get is someone ringing up because they've heard about us from yeah. someone that we support. Yeah. So, if somebody wants to help the charity in any way, what what do they do? Do they? Um, they can either go on the website, um, you know, or they can they can contact the charity directly and speak yeah. speak to myself. We're always open for ways for you know for um, people to come and come and support, whether that's people coming and volunteering their time. Whether it's becoming corporate charity sports for people's companies, businesses, um, the support that we provide, there's no one, no one out there doing it. You've done it. houses, there's all yeah, we've done the DIY SOS. We'll adapt to to what the families need. Yeah. We'll tailor our support, and we've said that from day one. We'll tailor that support as long as they fit within our criteria. Then you know, there's there's no point in us paying someone's gas bill if they're not worried about the gas bill. Yeah, just so we can say we paid someone a gas bill. Um, you know, there's no point in us paying something that costs 500 quid if that's not what they're worried about just to try and get 500 quid out saying oh we spent 500 pound it's not yeah um, and to be honest from talking about adapting what what's what's adapting quickly is our children's breathing support which is fastly becoming the most requested support time um, and from that there's massive changes happening with with once upon a smile yeah. Just um, on the bereavement support, and because it is the biggest service now, there's memory days. Or what, when yeah. we say bereavement support, what actually does that look like? So, so we're not clinical, is the first thing. So it's not children's counselling because there's a massive stigma, I think, to children's counselling. They think um, and children's bereavement support, 
I think people automatically think it, the child's going to go to counselling and that means, oh no, why, they need counselling and, it, and it's not. We, we offer children's bereavement support and it's a way for children to understand and express their emotion in a fun and safe environment. Um, so what happens with that is a family's uh, loved one's died, they, a referral is made to Once Upon a Smile and it's for children's bereavement support and that goes to Kelly. What Kelly does is it's a two part assessment. So the first assessment will be with parent or guardian to make sure that the referral we've received and the circumstances are the same or obtain that additional information as well and as much information as possible. And then also to find out from the parent or guardian's point of view where the child or children are at with regards to their bereavement. Then from that, as long as that fam, you know, as long as the parent or guardian is happy with the support that Kelly's discussed with them going forward, the second assessment is with the child to find out actually where they're at because often it's very different. Um, and they get introduced to Kelly, um, and from that Kelly will determine which she feels that child will best um, the support best suited yeah. for them. That could be group support, it could be one-to-one -one support, um, but just because the child or children go to a monthly group, what we will find and what we do do is we adapt from that. So we've got the, the monthly group and what we might observe is that there's some children in there that are showing signs of anger. So we'll create an anger group, a six weekly anger group where they come once a week for six weeks and they can express their anger in a number of different ways. Um, so they express their emotion through arts, crafts, music, um, a number of different ways. And those groups are always adapting and always changing for, for the children's needs. Yeah. Um, if somebody needs that kind of support, then what do they do? If somebody identifies some a family that they think might need yeah. might So need what we've done and what we've always kept with is uh, it's an online referral. Um, so they go on to our, if they give us a call, because it is password protected, they can make a self-referral. Um, and the form is designed, it's not going to take more than five minutes. The more information you put on there, the, obviously the longer it's going to take. Once that comes through to us, it's then given to Kelly. Kelly will make contact, invite them in. Um, we'll have a, you know, we'll sit down with them. Kelly will introduce herself, introduce the service. Um, because sometimes it might not be right for them. Yeah. Um, or they may not be ready for that, for that support. Um, but it has quickly become one of our most requested types of support, yeah. And it's something we're really, really proud of. But going on to volunteers, the volunteers for the children's agreement support are, are so, so, so valuable. Yeah. In terms of the future yeah. for the charity then, so it's seven years old. Yeah, so um, we've had an ambitious plan for the last couple of years. So we've wanted to create our own bereavement hub. So we wanted to change the way families within Greater Manchester or that can access the Greater Manchester area can access bereavement support. Yeah, but let's just touch on that for one sec. It's the North West. So for, to, for the time being, it's yeah. the North West, unless they can access the North West. Oh. Um, because with that, we, we don't want to run before we can walk. Um, you know, we, we are still a very small charity. And if, I think if we open it up too much, um, then, then we can, before we know it, we, you know, we're struggling. Um, but then saying that, it's the North West. If, um, so we want to create a bereavement hub, and um, it's something that I'm really proud of, to be honest, because those plans are, uh, are becoming reality. Um, so we're going to create our own building that's going to be a dedicated once upon a small building. The whole of the downstairs is going to be our children's bereavement centre, um, and there's going to be specialist and dedicated rooms. So there's going to be an arts and crafts room. Um, there's going to be a snuggles and smiles room. Uh, which is something we do for children aged two to six years because they're often forgotten about. And there's going to be a baking room, uh, there's going to be a music room where a lot of children express through music yeah. uh, or simply just banging drums. Um, there's going to be a multi purpose cinema room. Um, it's just going to open the charity up to support so many more families. Yeah. Um, and, it, it, and what we want to create is that hub for, hub for bereaved families. So hopefully that's going to happen early 2019 yeah. yeah and you've been you've had some um you've had a lot of support again from corporates on that yeah massive been, yeah i think corporates can sponsor a room and they can yeah nearly all of them have gone if not all of them I guess. we've got three rooms left to be sponsored yeah. um which i mean we've only gone out to our corporates now we've actually not gone out to 
to the public, yeah. um, which shows we've got we've got in-depth plans, and that's and that's all going through at the minute. But it's it's just going to be amazing, and it's just going to take us to the next level, and then hopefully from that that can be a model for for years to come where we yeah. can then move it to a yeah. different area. Brilliant. Right, well, we're almost at the close. <laughs> um, the, uh, I thought I'd end it with some. Uh, you're not allowed to say me to answer any of the questions. You can save the best play if you want. <laughs> no but chance. There will be a lot of people. I think you'll watch this or listen to it, and they'll probably support because there's a lot of supporters. There's people come all over the country. You know, I, I play from, in the odd game. They've travelled 200 miles. Sometimes. We've had people come from America. People come from Australia, yeah. Germany, Italy. Yeah, it's crazy. And that's just to see me. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, best player. Go on. Oh, who best player? Oh. To be fair, it's, uh, I mean we've got ex pros, so I won't count out yeah, the no. I won't count the ex pros because it's a bit unfair, though, isn't it? Um, if it's not Dan Gillings, then you know we've got a few actually. Danny's all right, you know. Yeah, put no. the ball in the back yeah, of the net. Yeah. I mean I won't tell him that. Can we edit that bit out? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, Nico's good player. Edit that bit with Paul Chi. <laughs> yeah. He's a good player. Remember the get? I remember they scored at Wolves. For Matt Murray's ruined, testimonial. Ruined Matt Murray's testimonial, didn't he? Like 30 yards or something. Yeah. yeah. 9,000 was there on that day, I Yeah, think. amazing. They sell a city bus, didn't they, to pick us up? <laughs> city team bus. Worst player? Worst player? I'm not that as. I can't say that because they all turn up and try. Oh, right. Pick one that doesn't play anymore. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to think of one. Richard Davis. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thinks he's the best player but isn't. You ruined it, man. <laughs> that could be you. I've got to be honest. Honestly, right, I've seen um, games being recorded. Right, they record it, so you think oh, I need to have a blinder. And when you play it, you're whizzing that ball around, and you're like, cannot wait to see this video because honestly, we look like a professional team. And then when you watch it, you're like, oh my, we're just so slow. And yeah. that ball that was whizzing about is like just trickling. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Loves himself. But I know one of you, but don't say me. <laughs> Loves himself. Loves himself. What is this? The players, is it? Yeah. Um, Jake Quickenden's always got his top off, hasn't he, on yeah. Instagram? Yeah. Uh, I've seen Danny looking in the mirror before he goes out. Yeah. As well. Yeah, I think Jake, I was going to say. <laughs> um, funniest thing you can remember on the pitch? Funny. I did after ones come off. Because because it was torrential rain and I got gel in my eyes and I literally couldn't see. Unbelievable. I know. Unbelievable. That's just not unbelievable. It's you. <laughs> Off the pitch, because you have a lot of nights out as well, so it must have been. Yeah, but we don't talk about them. No. We'll leave that. <laughs> Best silly game. Best silly game. We've had a few, you know, because we have big ones where Sheffield United yeah. we played and we beat them yeah. on penalties. Um, and big race every penalty in the 90th minute, and they would have, we they would have won. Um, Howard Webb was the ref, I think. Howard, yeah, he was the ref. We chased off the pitch after that, but uh, I mean, for a big game, that that was brilliant. Chesterfield, we used to go every year, it was great. But the, there's also some, you know, at the smaller grounds. Um, we played on Friday at Cheadle Town yeah. with against Stockport Academy, and yeah. the whole school supports yeah. supports it. So it's a great atmosphere. So there is there's there's a load of great games but for, all for the yeah. the role yeah. worst game probably the torrential rain one yeah that was freezing yeah I remember I remember you actually rigging me <laughs> to tell me best goal you've seen best probably Nico isn't it yeah against Matt Murray I mean. best on goal I'm going to take credit have you scored a goal <laughs> do you not remember it no tell me that this you one don't, no you don't remember against Marlon Beresford oh yeah <laughs> was that your first game uh, no it wasn't your first game it was horrific <laughs> It was horrific. Go on, have you had another one? I, I've, I've scored, ask Billy about this. Um, we're playing at uh, Tier, no, not Tier Nets, Airbus oh, Stadium yeah. last year. Yeah. And it was windy. And um, I absolutely blasted the ball back. And I mean, it was a strike straight past Billy to the point where, you know, normally everyone turns around and I'm going like, oh, everyone was like, what a strike. And I mean, <laughs> it was a strike as well. <laughs> When's the next game? Um, well, we're finished for this year now yeah. uh, because it's getting cold and wet. And yeah. people don't want to get their hair messed up, and well, so, yeah. uh, we start. Get gel in the eyes. <laughs> yeah, get gel in the eyes. Yeah. Uh, or a lot of people have had work done and don't want to head the ball. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> is that what they're <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> um, so we start again in, in April time. Yeah. Brilliant. Well, thanks for coming in, Dan. It's pleasure. been a pleasure to have you today. Um, that's the end of this podcast and interview. 
For those of you that want to see the next ones, this was episode three. Next episode is the rap artist and musician Bugsy Malone. Um, and so if you follow us and subscribe to us, the link's below. Thank you for listening or watching. Thank you.